Welcome to the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. We're having a policy forum today on Iran's nuclear proliferation strategy, U.S. policy options. And we will have uh, three speakers. First is going to be Michael Eisenstadt from the Washington Institute, who has just finished a study on Iran's nuclear hedging strategy, which you can find on our website. Um, and um, then he will be followed by uh, Masa Ruhi, who's a research fellow with the Center for Strategic Research at the National Defense University's Institute for National Strategic Studies. And following um, Masa, we will have comments from Suzanne Maloney, who is the Vice President and Director of the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. Uh, if you have questions that you would like us, any of the speakers to address, please direct them to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, or if you're watching us by uh, YouTube, uh, send email them to policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. That's one great big long word, policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. And I neglected to introduce myself, my apologies. I'm Patrick Clausen. I'm the Director of Research here at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and the Director of our Viterbi Program on Iran. Uh, with that, let me turn to Michael Eisenstadt. Thank you very much, Patrick. And I just want to say that I'm delighted that Susanna and Massa are here today. I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. Um, just a few introductory comments about why this monograph. Um, I've, for a long time, I've kind of had the feeling that the US policy debate on Iran and DC has tended to focus on the technical dimensions of the last mile of the proliferation process with a focus on centrifuges, breakout times, weaponization, et cetera. Now, if you're talking about a crash program such as the American experience during World War II, Clearly, technical factors really are the dominant factors when, you, when a country is trying to get the bomb as soon as possible for military reasons, technical factors dominate. And the result of this focus on uh, the last mile and, the, and technical factors is a narrow policy focus on efforts to halt or disrupt these activities, mainly by sanctions and diplomacy. Next slide, please. Um, or covert action. Okay. Now, all of these are essential elements of any non-proliferation policy. But this narrow focus comes at the expense of a more holistic approach. And so my hope is that by this discussion, we can look at Iran as a case of a nuclear hedger, and I'll discuss what that means in a moment. And hedging countries, generally, their proliferation calculus is suffused with politics and influenced by a broad range of factors, way beyond the technical factors that are often examined in, in Washington. And from a policy point of view, that raises the question of how do you shape all the factors that influence Tehran's proliferation calculus using all the instruments of national power in order to persuade Iran that proliferation restraint is in its interest. So getting away from an approach which focuses exclusively on deterrence and coercion and one that looks at dissuasion as well in order to, as Vipin Narang has said, to keep the hedger hedging. Next slide, please. Now, a little bit about hedging, what it means. Basically, hedging is all about creating or maintaining options to produce nuclear weapons. And you can hedge with the idea of trying to kind of like a, tentatively exploring your options with regard to nuclear weapons, or as a way to slowly and stealthily proliferate in a way that manages risks. And I'm kind of agnostic at, in terms of which path Iran is taking. I think there are people in the system in Iran um, who are focusing um, who, who support uh, either approach. Next slide, please. Now, a little bit about Iran's, the history of Iran's nuclear program and why Iran adopted a hedging strategy. Iran's nuclear program went through three phases. First, what I call nascent hedging, starting around the mid-1980s at the height of the Iran-Iraq war when um, it was, Iraq was using chemical weapons against Iran. Um, it was known that Iraq had a nuclear program that they were trying to rebuild after the Israeli strike in 1981. Um, so they kind of cast a wide net to 
gather technology and know-how. By the late 1990s, probably because they were concerned about the possible Iraqi progress towards a bomb, they instituted their own crash program called the Ahmad Plan, um, which was their plan A for acquiring a bomb. And that went on for about four years until about 2003 or so, at which time they transitioned back to a focused hedging and leveraging strategy to create an option for a bomb or create a bomb on a very long timeline. And that was their plan B. And that's the, that's the um, uh, approach they've been taking since the mid to late 2000s until the present. Now, as I mentioned, they originally tried to build a bomb in secret, but events led, it to con led Iran to conclude that the risks and costs of proliferation might be greater than they anticipated because of, first of all, foreign, foreign intelligence penetration of their program, which became clear starting in 2002 until the present. Likewise, after the US invasion of Iraq, there was concerns of a US military attack and they gave a halt order for their weapons program in 2003 in order not to give the US a, a, a reason to attack or invade. And then a few years later, the threat of UN and multilateral sanctions between 2006 and 2012. These all, these all factors combined to cause Iran to revert from active, the trying to dashing towards the bomb to hedging. I would also note that like a lot of hedging countries, Iran has decided to halt or reverse elements of its nuclear program at various times because either the program entailed unacceptable costs or continuing with the program would have jeopardized other key objectives, such as um, the economic health of the Islamic Republic, which had the potential to lead to instability and um, things like that. Uh, I'll just note though, that even when they agreed to halt or reverse elements of their program, they still continue to make progress in other areas. So for instance, their missile program, almost, which is very closely related to the nuclear program in many ways, continued almost um, without any um, hindrance during this entire last 20 years. Um, and likewise, even when they froze parts of their nuclear program, other parts were often able to move forward. And again, the goal I think is either to create a latent deterrence by accumulating large amounts of fissile material on hand or weaponized deterrence down the road by creating a bomb. We'll talk about that a little bit more maybe in a minute. Next slide, please. Now, the point is Iran's ambiguous, ambivalent hedging strategy, I think, might create opportunities to dis dissuade and deter it from pursu pursuing what I consider to be the three American red lines. We could talk about that um, a little later. Either a buildup of fissile material, a breakout, which I define somewhat differently than conventionally used, that is diversion of fissile material from safeguarded to unsafeguarded facilities, or an actual bomb. And again, the policy objective should be to convince Iranian decision makers to halt or reverse their nuclear program, or at least keep kicking the nuclear can down the road to avoid the decision to build a bomb for as long as possible. Now, in doing so, I think that the US has not used all the tools at its disposal in its nuclear diplomacy with Iran. We've focused very narrowly on sanctions, which is a very potent capability, but we've not done other things. And, and, and critics say we need to focus more on a credible threat of force, which, which I agree although I have kind of a different uh, approach to doing this than I think others. I'll discuss that a little bit more in a minute. But I don't think either sanctions or a credible threat of force, they are necessary, but I'm not sure they would be sufficient in order to um, effectively shape Iran's proliferation calculus in order to prevent them from getting a bomb down the road. For a very variety of reasons, um, basically sanctions, especially to the degree that we rely on sanctions on Iran's oil and gas sector, are subject to geopolitical considerations, price of oil worldwide, and it's not a lever that we're able to use without um, um, you know, hindrance. Likewise, a credible threat of force might not be available in all situations, especially for instance, if there's a crisis in a different part of the world or with China or Russia, um, we might not, first of all, the last three administrations have not been willing to countenance the use of force, it seems, even though the current administration has, you know. Um, set a very strong red line that Iran will not get nuclear weapons, under at least under President Biden's watch. And um, so this option may not be always available. So we need to 
think about different ways of convincing Tehran that proliferation restraint is in its own interest. And we need to use a holistic approach that uses all the instruments of national power, diplomacy, informational means, military means, economic means, and cyber, um, whether or not the JCPOA is concluded, and it seems like that's highly unlikely at this point. Next page, please. So here, and I apologize for the density, this is the kind of slide that Patrick loves to hate that I do. Um, the key to an American shaping strategy to influence Iran's proliferation calculus should aim to raise doubts in the minds of decision makers in Tehran about the risks, costs, and benefits of the bomb in order to influence its proliferation calculus. I'm not gonna go over all of these, they're in the monograph, you could read them. Um, and I'd be interested actually to hear some of uh, what Masa and, and, and maybe Suzanne have to say about some of these, for instance, the uh, fear of becoming a pariah state, whether this is still um, a, a, an important factor for Tehran or not. Um, I'm just gonna focus on four of these right now. Um, first of all, with regard to the credible use of, uh, or th credible threat of force. Like I said before, I think it's a necessary but not sufficient element of US policy. And it's not, it's something that we have not um, kind of put enough thought into simply because, you know, in the wake of the, the kind of uh, the aftermath of our interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan, there really isn't a lot of support for considering the military option in, in, in this region. But I think it's important to make the point that repeatedly American presidents who tried to avoid um, entanglement in Middle Eastern wars have done policy U-turns, um, dramatic policy U-turns. So for instance, George H.W. Bush during the crisis between Iraq and Kuwait in 1990 said the U.S., actually his, our ambassador um, to, to Baghdad said, the U.S. doesn't have an opinion about inter-Arab quarrels. And then when Iraq invaded Kuwait, it turns out that we did have an opinion and we led an international coalition against um, Iraq to get them out of Kuwait. Um, President George W. Bush, or candidate George W. Bush in running for president said that the U.S. doesn't do nation building, but after 9-11, the U.S. invades Afghanistan and then Iraq and engages in the biggest nation building efforts since World War II. President Obama running for president says no third Middle Eastern war, then ISIS takes a third of Iraq, and it turns out that we had a third Middle Eastern war. President Trump said desert and death, I want to, you know, the Middle East is, there's nothing good in the Middle East, I want to bring our boys and girls home. But he's the one who, under whose watch, we ended up killing um, um, Qasem Soleimani, and he incurred the potential for escalation in order to achieve that goal. So he took some risks in that regard. And then President Biden, with regard to the crisis in Ukraine before the Russian invasion, said, well, the U.S. response might be shaped by the degree to which the, the, the Russians in, invade, how deep they go, and how extensive the invasion is. And it turned out when Russia did invade, we responded very ro robustly and organized NATO um, to um, engage in an effective response. So the U.S. is capable of turning on a dime, and I don't rule that out in this case as well. I'd also say that in order to further give credibility to the potential threat of, of the military option, the U.S. should telegraph its acceptance of greater risk by responding firmly to Iranian attacks on U.S. interests in the region, mainly through gray zone activities, you know, kind of whether unacknowledged or, or covert responses to um, Iranian attacks on U.S. personnel and interests. And Iran will kind of make, I think the decision makers in Tehran will make the connection that if the U.S. is willing to incur risk with regard to low level attacks that threaten small interests, albeit American lives, um, that maybe with regard to the uh, potential Iranian decision to get the bomb, they might be uh, more willing to act militarily in such a case, and therefore it's, it's not worth the risk of, of doing so. The other point I wanted to make has to do with Iran, the vulnerability of, of a potential Iranian nuclear stockpile to sabotage or cyber attacks, which would then turn them into a double-edged sword against Iran, and that's number, bullet number uh, item number five on this list here. Iran has learned, and I mentioned before that they've you know, one of the reasons they engaged in hedging is because that they learned in 2002 that their system, to the degree to which their um, nuclear program had been penetrated by foreign intelligence services. And this is something which has been reinforced in the years that, since then. They've learned that they cannot protect their most important nuclear scientists. They cannot protect their most important nuclear facilities from sabotage, and they cannot protect their nuclear archive um, from, uh, from, from 
being you know, spirited out of the country by foreign intelligence services. And this creates a, an opportunity to make the point that if they were to get nuclear weapons, there's a possibility that disaffected elements of the IRGC might, um, especially in light of you know, the current unrest in the country, might divert um, weapons um, and use it against uh, parts of the regime, or that for, or they might, um, con- you know, elements within the system working for in- foreign intelligence services might sabotage the weapons or introduce, you know, um, um, you know, defects into the weapons, so they may not use uh, work if uh, needed. And in this situation, God forbid that they ever have to use uh, or launch uh, nu- missiles tipped with nuclear weapons, they may not end up where they're intended where they're launched at, that people either through cyber intrusion or people working for foreign intelligence services might introduce um, different aim points so that the missiles end up hitting military sites in Iran rather than in neighboring countries. So maybe this is not a good time to get nuclear weapons. Um, And this is something that which needs to be, you know, repeatedly um, emphasized to Iran through cyber activities, which indicates the ability of foreign intelligence services to penetrate Iran's cyber infrastructure. The next point has to do with the stabilizing potential of dual-use conventional and nuclear-armed missiles. Iran, right now, Iran's missile force and, and drone force is the kind of the crown, the crown jewels of its, of its military and provided with tremendous uh, deterrent and striking capabilities. But if Iran was to introduce nuclear weapons into its missile force, that might actually in some ways undermine the utility uh, and their ability to use conventional missiles. So for instance, God forbid in the event, let's talk about an event of a scenario involving Iran and Israel. I think Iran's tactic for penetrating Israeli missile defenses is saturation attacks using very large numbers of missiles. But if Israel sees large number of missiles coming at it, and it doesn't know whether these are conventional or nuclear, might it respond with a nuclear counterstrike because they're potentially in a use or lose situation? Now, one way that Iran could counter this possibility is by using very small numbers of missiles and strike, but then it's unlikely they'll get through Israeli missile defenses. So again, introducing nuclear weapons into the missile force creates dilemmas um, regarding the use of these missiles and might undermine the effectiveness of Iran's missile force. And then the final point I want to make is Iran's acute vulnerability to even a limited nuclear strike. Now, in 2001, actually on December 14th, if I remember correctly, 2001, so almost, um, you know, 21 years to, to, to the day, um, former President um, Rafsanjani made a statement to the effect that um, two or three bombs could destroy Israel, but um, you know a, a nuclear counterstrike against the Islamic Ummah would not destroy the, the Ummah. And this is not something which is unrealistic to think about. The fact of the matter is, Iran is very vulnerable to a, um, a missile counterstrike, and if you could go to the um, effects radii graphic here. Um, first of all, Iran is perhaps the most urbanized country in the Middle East and, and Asia, 75% urbanized. Tehran is extremely important in the life of the country. You have about, you know, only f- about 15% of the total population, the 50% of the industry, 30% of public sector workforce, and most of the higher education institutions are concentrated in the area of the capital. And then almost all the cities in Iran are very dense, and very compact, and you have very poor, you know, generally poor construction standards in the country, which would ensure that nuclear strikes would um, produce maximum casualties. So I remember in the 60s when I was growing up, I would see these kind of maps about attacks on New York and LA and DC, and I would look and look at where I lived and, you know, where I fell in within these effect radii, and it really had a demoralizing effect on me as a kid to understand you know, the, the devastating impacts of nuclear war. I think Iranian decision makers understand this, but it's useful to make these points and also to make the point for the general public. I don't think public opinion plays much of a role in these kind of decisions, but I think it's useful to kind of keep making these points and publish these kind of things in Persian and Farsi in order to perhaps um, change thinking in Iran about nuclear weapons the way that in the United States in the 60s and 70s, people's attitudes towards nuclear weapons changed very dramatically as a result of um, m- uh, movies like Dr. Strangelove and On the Beach and the, and the Day After and the Bedford Incident and the like, all of these things, movies of which I, I watched when I was a kid. Anyhow, next, next slide, if we could get to the last slide, please. So anyhow, let me just wrap up here. And, and, and the hope is, again, that these shaping um, activities 
will change Iran's attitude or the, 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 the attitude of decision makers in Iran with regard to the risks and potential costs of proliferation, as well as the utility of nuclear weapons and cause them to keep hedging. So the question I would just end up with, and this is something which I hope um, Masa and Suzanne will dwell, you know, dwell on a little bit in their response, or maybe we could discuss it during the you know, Q&A after. Can Tehran hedge indefinitely, or is it their hedging strategy a temporary detour on the road back to active proliferation? And what factors are likely to affect Tehran's calculus in this regard, and, and how does that affect our ability to kind of shape the calculus? You know, for instance, their ability to get the bomb without getting caught, perception of U.S., Israeli, or European resolve with regard to sanctions or military action, the effects of preparations for the succession. Will that make a return to active proliferation more likely or less likely in the future? I would just say that simply the very fact that Iran is heading towards a succession in the future means that Iran might be heading towards an inflection point with its nuclear program because people our policy. And since we might have different people at the top, we might see a different policy in this regard in the future. The impact, I would also ask the impact of domestic unrest in Iran today on its new, uh, proliferation calculus, none, or does it have an impact? The impact of the war of, in Ukraine and possible Russian use of nuclear weapons. Um, so anyhow, these are things that I hope we'll have in our discussion. But the, point, the bottom line I want to make from a policy point of view is the U.S. needs to do all it can do now in order to shape Tehran's nuclear proliferation calculus, because in many ways, Iran is already engaging in one of the things that I said it was important for the U.S. to prevent, which is a buildup of fissile material in the country, which could provide Iran with a latent deterrent. That is, they have very large quantities of high enriched uranium on hand, and the message to adversaries is, if you push us, we might weaponize it. And this in itself provides it with many of the risks many of the benefits of nuclear weapons with, without actually weaponizing. So we, we will face challenges even if we have this situation um, at the end of the day. Anyhow, this concludes my presentations, uh, my presentation, and I look forward to the comments of Masa and, and Suzanne, and thank you very much, as well as the discussion afterwards. Over to you guys. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. And so now uh, let's turn to Masa Ruhi for her, her reactions to this, on this issue. Thank you for putting together this great discussion. I first have to start with a disclaimer that what I share with you today is my personal views and does not represent views of National Defense University, um, Department of Defense or the US government. Um, and I wanted to say kudos to Mike for this great study, which I thoroughly enjoyed reading. It was very in-depth, very comprehensive. Um, and you know, it, it's a great, piece to get us started on thinking about how we move forward in the future. Um, I, I'm going to try to answer the question about sort of Iran's hedging strategy or the calculus, cost-benefit calculus, and whether and how the U.S. can impact it. And I'm going to start with a, a pessimistic or a skeptical note, which is, if you ask me this question, um, two years ago, three years ago, or any time up until that point, I would have had a long list of suggestions um, of how this could be done or how U.S. could, could actually shape or change that, uh, that calculus. Unfortunately, for the time being, I'm not sure there's much that we could do in the short run to change the calculus. Um, what I think U.S. could do and should be focusing more on would be um, would be a strategy of sort of managing the escalation that is lying ahead and uh, just sort of uh, managing the status quo. And at the same time, planning for a completely new approach um, as we move forward in terms of you know, I, I don't think P5 plus one would be the viable option moving forward and sort of a, an approach that will incorporate all different factors, including Iran's domestic uprising and the human rights violations and the brutal crackdown and how that will unfold the war in Ukraine, China, etc. So there's I think there's a lot of different factors that have changed. And I will make a couple of points about sort of why um, I, I make the argument that I just did. Um, 
and then I finish up with a couple of suggestions. So if I were to just broadly uh, generalize the factors that sort of um, have the most significant impact or shape Iran's calculus, um, I would say the number one would be a combination of threat perception of a military strike and um, the flip side of it, their deterrent capability. Um, and I, I think it's important for me to put sort of a, a caveat, which is there's a lot of debate about, well, attacking Iran's nuclear facilities does not necessarily mean another Iraq war. It could be a limited military strike. And I think for the past few years, uh, Iran has, uh, has sort of shaped its deterrent strategy in a way to make that limited strike a very costly and sort of not attractive option for the West, right? So in their view, they have put their uh, pieces and they've created strategic depth um, to impose costs in a way that there could not be an easy calculation for US and Israel or, uh, to, um, to have a limited strike without being, being able to endure sort of consequences and escalating into a, into a war. So that's one piece. Second, I think for them has been their perceptions or their evolving perceptions about the world order and what implications um, it would have for world economy, for security. And the third factor I, I would say is their technical and sort of security abilities and conditions for I think what Mike you call sneak out or creep out or overt breakout. So basically it comes down to the question of their perceptions of whether they can quickly and covertly break out or not, what the risks are um, and sort of the level of threats and how they perceive the response would be to each of these categories as, as, as they go on. So that's kind of the, the calculus, um, the way I see it. And, Looking at sort of the um, the perception about sort of so this calculus, the reason I said if you had asked me this before, I would have had a long list was that for years there was a there was a strong vision in Iran um, that Iran could normalize relations with the West and could become sort of a normal state and come out of this peria status and um, have normal economic trade investment and sort of grow. And at the same time, incrementally make progress on the nuclear program, staying with, 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 within some limits. And I won't get into the sort of the history of it, which is very detailed, but just overall sort of that has been the view. And, and Mike, you mentioned this too. Um, with the uh, Trump administration withdrawal and the maximum pressure strategy and the inability to return to the deal sort of swiftly um, when the Biden administration took office and a variety of other factors, the challenges of sanctions relief, that vision has completely evaporated. It disappeared, right? There is no more um, strong prospect of if we make compromises on our nuclear program, if we make our hedging strategy slow and stick with it, um, we will we will have other um, um, sort of benefits out of it, which means a sanctions relief. And we are at a situation, particularly now with, uh, with the human rights violations in Iran, that the layering of the sanctions on Iran are as such, and it will continue to be more, even more layered and complicated that I cannot imagine a scenario where they can have um, enough of a sanctions relief benefit that it would be worthwhile losing leverage and add to that the uncertainty of US domestic politics in the next administration, et cetera. So all of these factors to me is that I'm skeptical that there would be sort of a um, viable solution for the US made that kind of incentive that it used to be able to create um, before. And then we have the perceptions about US decline and a new world order, which has been sort of happening over uh, the past years, and particularly the, the hardliners have been um, you know, using this kind of strategic thinking and vision. And they believe sort of the war, uh, the Russia war in Ukraine and the US response and how it's unfolding 
has been, and, and then US China, the Taiwan issue and all the tensions that we'll see um, is an indication of the US decline and a move towards a multipolar world in which they can redefine a new role for themselves. And so we are dealing a very different calculus for them in which they would have to think whether in this new world order and the way they assess it, um, what would benefit them most, having a nuclear weapon or having continuing a hedging strategy? And I do not think that's even like 100% clear to them. I mean, you mentioned there are different views on that, but I think we are in a very uh, complex sort of international structure situation that they're really evaluating the situation. And I don't think when I when I hear discussions about, well, Russia is losing the war, Russia will lose the war. From, from Tehran's perspective, from what I understand, it's not about who wins or loses this war. It's about what are the implications of this war, the sanctions on Russia for the future of financial uh, system um, in the world. Would the sanctions in Russia really prompt or accelerate a new um, kind of um, a new financial structure that would allow Iran to um, circumvent sanctions more or, you know, um, use its resistance economy more efficiently. Um, and add to that the uncertainty about the domestic situation, which I'm happy to discuss in the Q&A if there was an interest, but I won't go into the details of that. And so what is that what is the US can do? And I think first is that currently, as I said, um, I don't think nuclear negotiations or, or diplomacy in, in the sense of reviving the JCPOA or having a new deal is, is a viable option. And I don't recommend that for two reasons. One, that is, I do not think it could lead for the reasons that I mentioned and the, for the fact that it would not yield to sustainable benefits for Iranians. Um, it would not yield to any kind of um, sustainable or favorable deal that would meet sort of U.S. Um, requirements. And for that reason, I think um, taking a, a step back and allowing the domestic politics and the uprising and, and, and people sort of um, protest and how this unfolds domestically um, would be would be wiser to do rather than sort of thinking about, okay, we, we're going to separate this and, and talk about the nuclear and let the others slide because it, it's just there is no separation. Um, and then so the, and there sort of what US can do, and I think would be helpful to do is there's so much unclarity about what we think about about the red lines or what are the consequences. So I think if we think about defining the rules and limits of escalation on either side, that would be quite helpful um, in the current circumstance. So clearly laying out consequences for um, you know uh, horizontal escalation, like adding to the stockpile versus, Vertical escalation, enriching to 90%. Uh, what are the consequences of sort of um, clandestine, uh, you know, di different scenarios that we can envision. I think if we can create a framework and, and, and make clear what the consequences will be and what are sort of the, the non unacceptable escalatory measures. Um, and I think Iran could convey similar, uh, you know, um, framework to the U.S. Um, I really think that's the best that can be done at this time. And I think I, I'll end with that. I think a big portion of uh, how Iran will think in the future, looking at this sort of evolving world order um, about how to approach its, its nuclear program again, would be its perception of whether Russia and or China um, would be able or would be open to um, Iran sort of stepping out of the hedging strategy to one of the categories that you mentioned, Mike. So um, I, I'll end with that and I'm happy to discuss other questions and details. Thank you, Masa, very interesting. And now if we can turn to Suzanne Maloney, please.
Thanks, Patrick, and, and thanks so much to Mike for inviting me to be part of this conversation and for his terrific monograph, which I think is a really important contribution to the current policy debate on Iran. Um, one of the, the great things about being the cleanup batter uh, in this lineup is that uh, most of the really smart things have already been said, and I find myself in violent agreement um, with uh, both Mike and with Masa around uh, where we're at and and where the Iranians may be at this time. Um, and I think one of the most important aspects of the conversation today, where I guess I, I will try to focus and to some extent reinforce some of what Masa has just said, um, is that we're having a conversation that isn't focused on the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action or, or on the idea of multilateral diplomacy to resolve the Iranian nuclear crisis, which has now been with us for at least two decades. Um, and I think that that's an important paradigm shift that we have to embrace and that uh, needs to be uh, sort of formally recognized on the part of both the analytic community, but also, of course, on the part of policymakers here in Washington and in, and in other key capitals. Um, you know, this has been the, the sort of framework that we have approached the problem of Iran um, with the nuclear issue at the pinnacle of all the concerns that we have about Iranian policy and with the idea of uh, some kind of multilateral diplomacy um, really since 2006, when it was in fact the Bush administration that sort of devised this construct of uh, the P5 plus one, uh, sought negotiations with Iran having backtracked from a prior position of, of eschewing any direct contact with the Iranians. Um, and since that time, you know, the, it's been a highly partisan issue. Obviously, there's been um, uh, almost a, a fixation on um, should we or shouldn't we with respect to the nuclear negotiations. And I think that it, in effect, it has dumbed down the debate and it has blinded us to the real uh, necessity of movement um, at a time when diplomacy doesn't appear to be effective. And so, you know, we, we, we're here now 20 plus months after the Biden administration came into office um, with, uh, you know, sort of a determination to try to use diplomacy to resuscitate the 2015 nuclear deal with Iran. Um, and uh, I give uh, Special Envoy Rob Malley all the credit in the world. He has traversed the globe. Um, uh, essentially looking for every opportunity to try to uh, develop a, a plan that would in fact bring the Iranians back into compliance with their obligations in exchange for the United States doing the same. Um, there has been uh, you know, quite a number of rounds of negotiations, none of which have in fact involved direct diplomacy between the United States and Iran because the Iranians refuse to engage directly with American officials. And despite a couple of false starts uh, earlier this year and then again uh, in late summer when it appeared that we were on the brink of some sort of an agreement with Iran, um, at this stage it doesn't seem remotely viable that we're going to uh, be able to negotiate a successful uh, detente uh, on the nuclear issue, much less get to any other sort of um, agreements with Iran that would curb some of its most dangerous behaviors. And so, you know, the focus should should needs to shift away from this, uh, you know, sort of fixation around the nuclear deal and, and the JCPOA in, in particular to an alternative options. Uh, the challenge is when you talk to policymakers, um, you know, first of all, I think there still is this almost um, defensive idea, in part because of the adversarial uh, debate that took place around the deal back in 2014 and 2015 and beyond um, that, that, you know, diplomacy has to be is the only uh, possible alternative that we have um, because there, there are no better alternatives. I think that's true. Obviously, we'd be in a better position if we could find a way to persuade the Iranians to re-embrace serious constraints to, in fact, go beyond the constraints that they agreed to in 2015 um, and to put new curbs on, on their missile program and other elements uh, of their uh, nuclear infrastructure. Um, but we have been unable to do so. And there are a variety of reasons. Obviously, the ground has shifted, the fact that the uh, Trump administration walked away from the deal. But the, the simple reality is we're never going to get back into the agreement. Um, and, and the conditions have changed within Iran as well. As Masa said, I think the debate at the leadership level is quite different today than it was over the course of, the, of uh, 10, 10 or 12 years ago when 
the seeds of the JCPOA were be, were beginning to be put together. And obviously society is in a, a very different place. And here, I guess I, I will take a moment just to say a few words about what's ha been happening on the ground, because I think that um, there is still uh, a sense of, I think, analytic incoherence about exactly what's happening. Um, there is a, a very vocal discussion among the diaspora, especially, and among Iranians, um, to the extent one can engage with them directly about uh, what is happening uh, in terms of the protest movement. And, and in many ways, I think the, the consensus is that it is uh, quite different than any uh, prior round of unrest that we've seen in Iran. But there's also a tendency to dismiss the salience of this um, as senior U.S. and, and uh, other intelligence officials have indicated, nobody anticipates that it's going that the unrest on the ground today is capable of threatening the near-term viability of the system in Iran. And so, therefore, I think there's a sense that you know this is uh, you know even if it may be different, even if there is something new and important about what's happening on the ground in Iran, um, that fundamentally the same parameters remain in place for our uh, international security concerns. I think that's not true. I think that, um, you know, in fact, what's happening on the ground does have an impact on the leadership's uh, calculations um, and that the fact that we have a, uh, a serious uh, and probably quite long-term threat to the, the resilience of the Islamic Republic, to the legitimacy of the Islamic Republic, has a direct impact on Iran's, uh, on the leadership's capability for diplomatic flexibility, on its readiness to cooperate with the West, and on its capability to make durable commitments. Um, I watch what's happening on the ground. Um, closely, and I think back to the Obama administration's efforts in 2009 to try to jumpstart diplomacy with Iran at a time where it seemed um, very difficult to do so, and at a time when obviously Iran was at that time also uh, in, in some a period of domestic turmoil. And in fact, there was a brief success story there in October of 2009 when a confidence building measure around provision of fuel to the Tehran research reactor was concluded. The deal immediately fell apart, in part because of this uh, infighting within the system itself uh, as a result of what was happening on the ground. And I think that we can anticipate that even if we could get back to some uh, possibility of, of movement around the JCPOA, we would find ourselves in a very, uh, very quickly in a situation in which um, we would not, uh, in fact, have much confidence in the durability of any agreement that we negotiate with a regime whose people are rising up against it every day and who's uh, committing atrocities and executions simply to stay in power. So I think that the, the domestic situation is um, particularly important in terms of shaping Iran's calculus. I think the other big uh, set of issues is, is something that uh, Massa spoke to, and that is the the change in the in the geopolitical order worldwide. And and my interpretation is that the Iranians uh, are benefiting directly from what appears to be a, a, a more um, empowered China and empowered Russia um, as meaningful alternatives, viable alternatives to a future that is dependent on the Western-led economic and, and geopolitical order. Um, we know that back in 2013, that, you know, in fact, in 2015, it was a Supreme Leader who said that I Iran did the deal to, to see sanctions relief and that the foremost demand on the part of Iranian negotiators was for the removal of the sanctions that prevented Iran from accessing the SWIFT payments mechanism. Um, I, I, I think that this Iranian leadership, both because of the, the uh, ideological composition of the, the current lineup, as well as because the, the world has changed so dramatically since 2015, is no longer interested in a, in a world in which Western companies are their primary trading partners. They're counting on an economic future that relies on China, relies on Asia, and a security future in which they are tied directly to the, the, the Russian leadership. Um, and this is, to my mind, a very, very much a losing calculation, um, but I think that we see no evidence that, there, that Iranians can be persuaded to try to um, uh, withhold or or to um, or, or to continue their hedging on the basis of uh, a fear of isolation from the West, and so I think that puts the challenge even uh, more significant. 
um, when we think about how it is we might persuade the Iranians um, to, to move down on the escalation ladder. Um, and one piece of evidence around this is simply that we can see that the, the, the regime has become much more malign and more risk tolerant in terms of its willingness to um, engage in violence beyond its borders, not just beyond its borders in the region, but an uptick in the targeting of dissidents and, and former government officials, both in the United States and Europe and other parts of the world. And that was a, a, a sort of um, behavior that the Iranians appeared to have gotten out of after 1997. Uh, when the uh, Euro European powers withdrew their diplomats from Tehran uh, as a result of the conviction of the regime or the indictment of the regime uh, in, in terrorist activities in Germany. Um, but, uh, you know, clearly um, whatever restraint had been counseled within Tehran, uh, all the gloves are off today. And so I think that what we're seeing is um, a shift in the regime to, un to embrace more risks, and that has direct implications for its willingness to continue uh, along the nuclear escalatory ladder. I think it's important for us to have uh, a plan B, essentially, um, and and that we have to actually develop a, a set of alternatives to the pathway for, of diplomacy that rely on some of the shaping mechanisms and tools that Mike has outlined in this monograph, be, being clear about what the red lines are um, and looking for ways to reinforce to Tehran that uh, the military threat is not simply a, a paper threat, that it is very much a real threat. And that requires working not just with our partners and allies in Europe, but I think there's there's a role to play for other powers. As Masa said, it's hard to imagine that P5 can be a, a viable construct at a time when uh, the US-Russian relationship is so necessarily uh, toxic. But I do think that the Chinese have a different role to play than they have at any point in prior uh, diplomacy with Iran, because it's effectively the Chinese who are uh, keeping the Iranian economy alive. Um, and so, I, you know, one of the things that I, I hope the administration is uh, considering is reengaging in diplomacy around managing the threat of Iran, just as they did in the run up to the, the 2013 uh, interim deal with the Iranians. That was the product of intense diplomacy or after the 2009 uh, confidence building measure fell apart, an intense effort by the Obama administration to mobilize economic pressure on Iran and to develop a real consensus about the urgency of the threat posed by Tehran. Uh, we have a lot of issues and divisions uh, at stake with China, but I think that there can be nobody who wants to see um, this government get access to uh, the most dangerous weapons in the world. And so whether or not we can find some avenues to persuade the Chinese to take on a more central uh, role in the diplomacy of um, uh, coercing and persuading the Iranians to move back um, is going to be particularly important because what I find challenging about our current situation is that there is a concern about uh, adopting any pressure mechanisms toward Tehran uh, about how they will react. Um, that if we in fact set red lines, that they will seek immediately to to uh, to violate them, um, and they essentially uh, it becomes something of a standoff because of the concern that the Iranians, if we take any uh, additional action, say snap back of the UN Security Council resolution um, sanctions that that they could simply ramp up to 90 percent or they could throw out the IAEA inspectors. And I think we have to make clear about what's going to be necessary to sustain uh, the 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 situation that we have at hand. Um, no peace, no war. Um, but if we are uh, not able to do so, that there are real measures, if the Iranians um, do undertake some of the measures that, that uh, are of concern, that there are measures that we can take to make that um, highly, uh, highly uh, unpleasant for them. So I'm going to wrap up there. I think I've gone over my time, but I really do look forward to the rest of the discussion. And thanks very much to both Mike and Masa for putting all the right issues on the table. Thanks ever so much. And now comes the moment I enjoy most where I get to start asking questions. But I want to encourage all of you to send in your questions. Please <coughs> use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen uh, if you're on Zoom. Or uh, if you're on YouTube, please email your questions to policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. That's one great big long word, 
Policy Forum at WashingtonInstitute.org. So let me start with some questions. First, I guess this is primarily to Michael. I'd be interested in uh, our other participants' views on this question. Uh, the United States government appears to have had little success influencing Iranian support for terrorism. It's destabilizing activities, it's human rights violations. Why do you think we could do better influencing their, their calculations about nuclear issues? Well, I, actually, I think we've had, um, I would say, modest success. It's, it's a mixed record um, with regard to some of Iran's other uh, destabilizing or, or malign activities. Um, part of the problem, I think, to the degree, and, and I, I mean, I'll go back. I mean, there are times, for instance, um, going back to the uh, Mykonos affair in 1992, where that was the last time for about um, 20 years, uh, a little more than 20 years, in which Iran engaged in um, activities in Europe against dissidents. And then after, I think, 2015 or so, they started ramping up these activities, um, in part, I think, due to um, um, EU breaking relations with Iran, although it only lasted for a few months. Um, and then there's other things that we've done that have, uh, I mean, look, the fact of the matter is, we did get Iran to go from crashing and dashing, uh, a crash program between 1999 and 2003, to hedging by the by the threat of, I mean, it's not something we did intentionally, it's because we invaded, first we were in Afghanistan and Iraq, but the, the, the perceived threat of, um, the perceived imminent threat to Tehran caused Tehran to dramatically change its approach um, you know, to, to nukes. And likewise, sanctions on Iran between 2010 and 2012, um, you know, laid, paved the way for the diplomacy that, um, you know, Massa and, and Suzanne discussed, you know, JPOA and then JCPOA. Now, of course, I, I think they're right that the current conditions are not conducive to a return to diplomacy. But the point is, I think it shows that certain levers of national power can influence Iranian choices, um, although under a different context. Um, and there's also, as I mentioned in my, in my uh, talk, there's a lot of levers we're not using. Um, and I think part of the problem, you know, one, one of the reasons I wrote this paper is because those of us who have been kind of hitting our heads against the wall with regard to trying to get the administration to be a little more um, forward leaning with regard to willingness to use force, even if in the, um, con you know, in response to Iranian activities, even if in the context of gray zone activities, you know, I felt that we that that's in itself because of the reticence of of, of several administrations in a row to use the military, uh, our military capabilities in response to things that Iran was doing. We need to develop other options, and I agree. There's a there's a bit of kind of throwing spaghetti on the wall to see what what sticks, and that's what policy is about. Though it's 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 a learning it's a learning uh, process, and you see what works with the adversary and what doesn't work, and you. What works, you try to refine, and what doesn't work, you try to ask yourself why it didn't work, and then maybe you can kind of um, um, refine your approach. So I don't claim that any of these things will work, but I think we need to, if you're fighting, if you're, if you're engaging with an adversary right now who's kind of moving forward with high, high enriched, um, with the enrichment or stockpiling of high enriched uranium, and, and we're facing the possibility of them producing weapons granted uranium, we need to do something, or we need to do more than we're doing now. And so we have to see what works. So again, I, I don't know if any of this will work, but we're, we're doing, there's a lot of things that we're not doing that I think we can be doing. And we could do it without incurring a significant risk of escalation. Comments? Asa. Thank you. I agree with Mike, but I'm going to actually um, try to give a different answer to your question about the difference on the nuclear versus the two other, you know, I, I consider three pillars to Iran's um, deterrence strategy. One is what it calls a strategic depth or its network of uh, non-state actor partners in the region. The other is the missile po program and the nuclear. And the, the big difference between nuclear and the other two is that the other two are short-term immediate capabilities, right? So Iran knows that if it were attacked tomorrow, these two capabilities will be what it can resort to immediately. And they already create a deterrent 
um, capability for Iran, whereas nuclear is more of a long term option. They don't have the weapon yet. Right. So they don't have the benefits of it. And so they can afford in return for or they at least in the past, it has been the case that they have been able to afford to sort of prolong this and make it more incremental in return for receiving other um, other benefits, whether economic, conventional, military, et cetera. And so I think the reason why the other two has been off limits um, and the nuclear has had on and off some level of progress um, is that. But I will add is that as they are just getting like inching closer and closer and we move forward. Um, I think Patrick, you're right that we, you know, our ability to have success with nuclear will become kind of sim very similar to, um, to the other two. I'll just jump pile on um, very briefly to say that uh, I, I, I think we have to be very realistic about our ability to shape the calculations of the Iranian leadership, particularly the current constellation of leaders in power in Iran. Um, Patrick, as you said, there are, there are certain positions that the, the leadership appears to have held over many, many years. Um, and, and despite considerable pressure and, and efforts on the part of the United States, we haven't been able to ingrain a more constructive attitude. Um, so I, I think, you know, you start with that point of, of awareness that um, we are going to uh, have to work very hard and we are ultimately going to have to use very blunt instruments. Um, but as Masa said, we have um, at times persuaded the Iranians that there have been, uh, that there are uh, off ramps uh, rather than escalation would be preferable. And I think that that's uh, an important precedent to remember. Uh, and I do think that, you know, there's a, there is an uh, understanding of the, the, the consequences of the nuclear program uh, with a greater degree of sensitivity um, in terms of uh, Iran's own vulnerabilities, as Mike has said, um, than the, some of the other issues that we have uh, sought unsuccessfully to uh, impact in terms of Iran's strategic thinking. So I, I think that you know there's there's value in in this approach, recognizing though that we have to have um, uh, other other policies and other tools um, that are prepared to address uh, Iran's uh, tendency toward recalcitrance. And if I could just add one more point, just a few weeks ago there were the reports that came out of a pen or a preparations for an Iranian attack on Saudi Arabia and apparently didn't happen and um, perhaps in part due to things that the United States did. But that only underscores the fact that this will take a lot of um, bandwidth of senior decision makers in order to achieve results. And I'm just not sure it's not it's there at a time that we're dealing with a crisis with uh, Russia and Ukraine, um, China, domestic economic concerns, COVID and the like. Um, this is this is high maintenance policy. Uh, Iran always is. Well, just to make the task a little more difficult, I'd like to ask you, uh, we not only have to have success containing uh, Iran's aspirations, but we have to persuade other states that were being successful at doing that. Um, could you talk a bit about what you th what impact the measures you propose might have on uh, dissuading Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, uh, and others from pursuing a proliferation uh, along the lines of what Iran's doing. If, if um, Maso or Suzanne want to deal with that first and... Don't be shy, speak up. Easy problem, right? So not, not hard to persuade them. Well, well let, let me just ju jump in uh, on this and, and just uh, start things. Um, let, let me just say that um, one thing that impresses me is the degree to which, um, despite the fact that Iran was moving forward until 2015 and then has resumed um, its activities since 2019 in the nuclear arena, we don't see a lot of rapid movement, at least those of us outside of government, we don't see a lot of rapid movement in Turkey or Saudi Arabia, never mind uh, Egypt in this regard. So um, I, I always felt that um, we, we do see some hedging behavior um, among some of these countries to create kind of a, a modest uh, degree of nuclear latency, as they say, or kind of an infrastructure that could be used as a springboard in the future. But it's they're not on a fast train, any of these countries. So that does give us, I think, a little bit uh, more time. I think the the issue that you raised, though, that's related to this 
is confidence in American, um, uh, you know, uh, in American uh, America's security guarantee. This is where we, and, and I think this is all kind of related. We have a lot of work to do um, based on um, decisions taken by the Biden administration, the Trump administration, and the Obama administration, which have undermined uh, mis mistakes, and and also the Bush uh, administration before that. For instance, the, the invasion of Iraq was seen as a gift to Iran, um, almost intentional by many of our Gulf allies. That why did you hand Iraq over to Iran? Um, you know, some of President Obama's policies and his interviews um, in the media um, criticizing some of the Gulf states was was uh, understandably, you know, um, taken. You know, they took it very hard. Um, President Trump not responding to the um, the attacks in Saudi Arabia and in September of 2019, and then likewise the attacks in uh, in uh, UAE. Um, of uh, uh, January of um, last uh, this last year, so um, we we've kind of by our mistakes we've made and by our inaction have undermined our the standing our standing with our allies, and it's going to be very hard. I don't think we could ever put the toothpaste back into the tube, but we can do more to regain some of the lost ground in this regard by taking a more proactive approach for our own reasons because it's in our own interest to do so, and I think it'll help mitigate some of the problems we have. But I think they're into hedging now in their own in their own diplomacy going forward, um, never mind in the nuclear domain. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, we, we have a problem and I don't see an easy way out of it. Care to contribute? All right, let me move on to the next question. Um, so could you talk about what impact you think there is on the uh, Iranian nuclear calculations uh, when the United States or the European Union uh, designates the IRGC as a terror organization to put pressure on the regime, do these kind of steps uh, affect Iran's nu nuclear calculations? I don't. I don't see many connections, but I'll. I'll. You know, if, if Suzanne or Massa have a comment. I agree with Mike. Um, I don't see that particular designation by the Europeans have an impact on nuclear program per se. Um, I do think that it's important for um, the Europeans and also for the US to take measures in response to Iran's um, increasing sort of um, violations and the crackdown. Um, but as to whether this will have an impact on the nuclear program, I'm I'm not sure how I can make that case. I'll just say that if you look at since 2019, since Iran in response to maximum pressure has been ramping up its nuclear program, it was, it was mainly on a kind of a tit for tat basis, which is kind of their modus operandi. They tend to compartmentalize, um, not, not always completely, but um, so you know, in response to pressures related to um, their nuclear program, they'll respond with um, nuclear progress. Uh, and, and I think that's generally been their, their approach. So I, I, I'm not sure this, this is kind of has, is relevant in this case. All right. Another major, excuse me, that's been discussed at times is uh, should the nine, what impact is there on Iran's nuclear calculations if the United States cooperates more with Israel and providing Israel with capabilities that could be used for military actions against Iran's nuclear program? There's been a lot of discussion over the years of providing various things to the, the Israelis, uh, some things they've asked for, like uh, um, air tanker refuelers, and some things they haven't asked for as much, uh, like uh, uh, bunker buster bombs. You know, my concern is that, um, I mean, first of all, Iran already is dispersing, hardening, and 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 burying. You know, and and they've been going doing this since they built Natanz and Fordo in the in the um, in the twenty and in the two thousands. They've been you know trying to um, harden their program against attack. Um, might they then decide to disperse this own material away from? Um, uh, safeguarded facilities in response to moves like that, I think only in the context of a crisis, not as a routine move, because that would have major implications um, in terms of their international standing and, 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 and the IEA and the UN Security Council. So um, I think they will constantly look for ways in which they can further uh, 
protect their program. And also they've, they've been building up their air defenses. That's been a big um, kind of, as, as our colleague uh, Farzi Nadimi has noted, one of their big breakthroughs in recent years um, that's not given the attention that their drones and missiles are given. But um, so they'll continue with this stuff, but I don't see them taking any dramatic steps in regard to kind of routine upgrades of Israeli capabilities in response to things that the uh, US might be uh, you know, providing Israel. So. If I may um, just add to that, I think it has been kind of an implicit assumption in, in their calculus for years that um, if there were to be an Israeli attack, it would be with U.S. support or combined with sort of U.S. attacks. So they kind of see this as, as, as one. And so, um, as Mike mentioned, I'm not sure, and they have been accordingly sort of uh, making decisions or, 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 or strategy. And so I'm not sure how just sort of transferring would be any different for them. I'll just jump in to say that, um, you know, I, I agree with everything that both Mike and Masa have already said uh, on this point, but I do think that there, uh, you know, is some utility to demonstrating that the United States and its partners and allies have options. Um, that's obviously the, the fundamental approach of um, the administration in trying to build up its uh, defense cooperation and security cooperation through the Abraham Accords with a number of Iran's neighbors. Um, but one of the, the key factors in Iran's decision making is whether it judges the United States is willing to take military action in response to pro provocation or escalation on the part of the Iranians. Um, and and so, you know, and I think that there's good reason, given um, both the, the kind of precipitous departure from Afghanistan last year, uh, as well as the other big security challenges that the United States has prioritized and is deeply engaged with right now, both the, the urgent threat of Russia and the pacing challenge of China. Um, that that you know, there's there's just no appetite on the part of the Biden administration for any kind of fight in the Middle East. So I, I do think that signaling, um, including through our partnership with the Israelis, but also in terms of what we're doing on the ground in the Gulf, um, that you know, just while while we're not eager for another fight, and while there are limitations to what we're able to take on at a time where we're so deeply engaged in these other crises, uh, that we're also uh, willing, if necessary to take the actions uh, to prevent Iran from from acquiring nuclear weapons capability because fundamentally that's something that every president including current president Biden has said and if we're going to make that rhetoric uh, actually have an impact on Iranian the Iranians calculus we've got to be able to demonstrate that uh, we're putting our money where our mouth is and putting our materiel where our mouth is so I do think that there you know, is it, it, we, we have to think strategically, but, you know, the Israelis have been quite successful in some of their own efforts to try to deter or erode Iran's nuclear capability. Uh, and so that partnership is incredibly important. Could I jump in and ask um, Susanna Massa a question, if, if you don't mind, Patrick? Um, I, I One of the things I kind of wrestled with in this paper is the whole issue of latent deterrence. And really, what does it give? Iran. And I, and I made a, a comment, um, you know, during my presentation that maybe from their point of view, latent deterrence gives them many of the benefits of nuclear weapons without the risk of actually building a weapon. But is that really true? And, and this is something which I'm in my in my own mind kind of have not decided. Um, so I just do you do you either of you have opinions on this matter? I mean, because on the one hand, you know, the United States, this, despite, you know, Possessing nuclear weapons was defeated in in Vietnam, and and you know Iran likes to say they were defeated in Iraq and Syria as well, um, and that's what actually the Khamenei says. The reason why they don't want nuclear weapons is that look, we defeated our enemies without nukes, but they are going down this path now of building up a stockpile of of high enriched uranium, which potentially gives them this kind of kind of um, perceived latent deterrence. So, what's your thoughts about that? I guess I'll start. I mean, my presumption is that Iran, having established itself as a threshold nuclear power, is going to be unwilling to cede that capability in any fashion, That because it does grant some uh, prerogatives of, of greater immunity from threat and coercion. And that's what the Iranians are fundamentally after. 
I, I find it interesting that, you know, as your paper points out, the Iranians have had a longer nuclear program without success than any other state in the world. And that does um, lead to, you know, obviously there are reasons for that in terms of the external environment um, and the impediments that have been put in, in the way of Iran's progress. But I think it also creates some question about what the ultimate uh, what the ultimate destination for the Iranian leadership is, and we have you know heard nothing from the U.S. intelligence community that leads to any um, questioning of the the infamous NIE that the Iranians have abandoned their weaponization activities. Um, we know that of course there's a there's been more money thrown at some of these activities um, in the course of recent years as a result of um, some of the efforts by the Israeli and others to sabotage Iran's program. Um, but ultimately, the Iranians appear to be um, appear to be comfortable with the destination, which is not um, a, a fully operational nuclear weapons capability. Um, and I believe that that reflects a calculus that it serves their purposes without uh, increasing the risks. Um. I, I tend to agree. I, so there, there are a couple of things. I mean, I the, the argument, Mike, that you mentioned, and I've I've heard from many colleagues before, is that well, if they're they think they're hedging for deterrence, then that's they're also inviting military attack by doing so by escalating. So how how is it going to sort of balance? And I think. There are several factors to that. One is that they didn't start from point zero. They started from already having a lot of sanctions. And throughout their journey, um, they sometimes developed further as leverage building, as bargaining chip. Or they sometimes developed further as making smaller steps or incremental steps, as, as you categorize, I think, as a creep out into having that kind of capability. But in terms of long-term vision, as far as I can remember, sort of ever since at least 2003, the overall agreement has been a, a Brazil model, right? And um, I'm not sure that will remain the same. So I think a lot has changed. But the idea was Iran, and I, I, and I quote sort of something that was debated in, in a discussion about the utility of Iran's nuclear program and its strategy uh, in a discussion with um, Zarif and Kharazi, the former foreign minister, and some experts, which um, it was said that, well, if uh, compare Iran with Pakistan and Malaysia, Malaysia being a very developed economic sort of um, actor, and then Pakistan having the nuclear weapons, and we, you know, our aspiration is neither because Iran is not inward looking just for security. So developing the weapon would not would not sort of be sufficient because it has sort of extraterritorial ambitions and power projections regionally and globally. And so the hedging kind of provided um, the best of both worlds in a way, or at least the objective provided the best of both worlds. And then they went down this path, which already paid a heavy cost that you go deeper and deeper and deeper that you really need to get enough return <laughs> than for being able to uh, make a compromise. So I think there are several factors. And at each point in time, I think there has been an evolution of how they think about this hedging strategy. And I and I actually think we are at a turning point right now and the future of not only sort of um, how the geopolitical uh, system in the world changes, but also the how this domestic uprising unfolds, I think will have significant impact on how Iran will, um, whether it will revise or completely change or diverge from that, that, that strategy or not. Let me return to a comment that uh, Suzanne made and, and explored that a little bit. Suzanne was talking about the firm statements that the United States government has made for years now that it, the U.S. will not allow Iran to acquire nuclear weapons and that all options were on the table. And of course, we've heard even stronger language from the Israeli government about uh, all options are on the table. Um, how credible is that? I mean, why should Iran pay attention uh, when the 
both the Israeli government and the U.S. government have at various times uh, defined certain actions that Iran might take, like uh, enriching to 20 percent, much less 60 percent as being utterly unacceptable. And yet Iran has done them and not doesn't seem to have paid heavy consequences for this. Why should Iran believe that, in fact, all options are on the table? And why not think that through a hedging strategy, you can eventually uh, gain acquiescence uh, to um, nuclear weapons development? Mike, let me start with you on that one. Actually, I'll just, I, if I could, Please. if I could turn to either Maso or, or Suzanne. I, okay, I, I'll just, I'll just, on, on that one, I mean, look, I, I agree with you. Right now, Israel and the United States doesn't have a lot of credibility. The Israelis have been kind of, you know, repeating their, their, their um, warnings that Iran um, would reach a point where they would, you know, need to take action. And um, I think Khamenei, in 20, last time that he kind of expressed himself that um, you know, at least looking at his 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 speeches about concerns about the possibility of an attack were around 2013, 2014 or so before the JCPOA. And since then, I, I see no sign. In fact, just a couple of years ago, he said, if you remember, um, I think it was during the Trump administration, he said there will be no war. It was a there was a speech he gave where he said there will be no war. And I think that is basically their fundamental approach that um, that they've been hearing you know, kind of um, these threats for so long that they kind of just, uh, you know, kind of have kind of factored it into their, you know, uh, calculus and, and they just don't believe that's going to happen, which is why kind of why I said warning, you know, kind of exercises are just not enough. Exercises on their own, which demonstrate a capability to strike at Iran's nuclear infrastructure is not enough. There has to be actual tangible American action that indicates that America's risk calculus has changed, that we are more risk acceptant in order to change Iran's thinking on this issue. So I, I just think without, and, I, and I'm not, I don't see any willingness in DC to do that at this time. So um, I'm just skeptical that we'll be able to, um, without a fundamental decision to um, actually accept a, a greater incremental risk. And I, and I don't think it's, it's, it's a lot, but more assertively respond to Iranian attacks on US interests. Um, not to handle plots to conduct attacks in the United States through the law enforcement system, but but, but you know, through um, but responding to them militarily, um, we're not going to be able to change Iran's perception, uh, threat perception in this regard, and alter their um, prol proliferation calculus. Oh, well, now there's an optimistic note. Uh, well, no, it's, it's, it, we can do it, but we just we need to be do we need yeah, to do things that we've not been willing to do until now. Yeah, but you're saying you don't see any appetite in Washington to do that right now. So, uh, with Suzanne uh, uh, Massa, would you would you care to comment on that? Um, I'm I'm going to make a comment that I, I completely agree with sort of what Suzanne mentioned and 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 your question and why they should believe that. And I think the the there's no way that you can just credibly say we're, we're going to attack like we mean it, <laughs> um, especially because, as I said, everything is so vague and unclear under what circumstances there will be attack. I mean, um, how would it look like or, you know, when I mentioned there has to be sort of some rules of uh, escalation. I think, as, as Mike mentioned, it can start with sort of little steps, right? You draw um, red lines elsewhere where Iran has activities and U.S. has interest, and you follow through with that. And those steps slowly build up into at least a, 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 a sort of a not a complete change in the perception, but you know, it, it would make it clear that we mean what we say, right? So if we say this is you should not do X, Y, and Z in Iraq or Syria, and then you do that, this will be the response. And those things, I think, 
you know, I understand politically there might not be the appetite in Washington, but I think those are net, I mean, without those kinds of smaller steps, actions to make a sort of clear um, line, I, I don't see how we would change their perception about the viability of a military attack. I'm not sure I have much to add. I think that, um, you know, there's more that the United States can and should do to try to um, reinforce the message to Tehran that we have options available to us and that the the commitment to ensure that Iran does not obtain nuclear weapons capability is one that is uh, meaningful in practice as well as in rhetoric. Um, I don't know to what extent we're going to be able to make that persuasive um, in the mindset of Iranian decision makers. But again, I you know come back to the to the timeline and the calculus that we've seen so far. The Iranians have um, exhibited some willingness for restraint. It took a year after Trump walked away from the deal before we saw the Iranians begin to um, edge out of their uh, compliance with the terms of the, their own obligations under the deal. Um, even now, they have uh, not taken the most extreme steps, um, and so I think that, you know, they they have some ca capability for pragmatism, and um, I, I think that there is enough recognition that even if the United States weren't prepared to hit, the Israelis would be, and there should I think there can be real no real doubt about that, and and even if they did so um, without the knowledge or support of the United States, we would very quickly be pulled into a conflict with Iran. So there could be a fait accompli even if they don't believe that the United States has the will or the resources to undertake uh, the use of force to stop that stop them from crossing the nuclear threshold, and that itself um, can have some deterrent effect on their actions. If I could jump in, and I just wanted to ask a question um, that I kind of tried to grapple with in writing this piece um, of, of both Suzanne and Massa. Um, you know, one of the, I think, reasons that Iran um, engaged in hedging, beside the proximate reasons, that um, it enabled a satisficing approach with regard to dis different factions within the regime. So that there were those that, you know, and, and in the words of Nima Garami, who wrote a, a really great piece on this a few years ago, you had detractors and centrists and supporters with regard to the nuclear program. And by hedging and then agreeing to the JCPOA, you gave to um, um, the detractors of the nuclear program or centrists actually, um, some of, you know, some of what they wanted, uh, sanctions relief and, 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 but still, you know, preserving the nuclear capability. In terms of supporters, you gave them a, a, a roadmap to further development of the program down the road. So it's kind of like a satisficing approach. Can you talk a little bit about the domestic political landscape today? Because a lot of the um, kind of uh, the reformers are out, the pragmatic conservatives for the most part are out for the most part. And among those who are most important today in decision-making, I mean, how many of them are kind of um, centrists versus supporters, centrists with regard to the nuclear program versus supporters who would, who would you know, support going for the bomb? Um, what, what is the internal balance like and is there a need for satisficing anymore? Um, or is that still a, a, a dynamic that there are different factions even within the current power structure, those arguing for restraint versus those, beside the Supreme Leader, those arguing for restraint versus those arguing to move forward? Or has the su success of the hedging strategies just basically converted everybody or, or the opposite? Let me jump in quickly and then Masa will correct anything that I misstate uh, or expand uh, upon anything that I may try to say. Um, I think there's been a tendency to impute uh, the kind of factional differentiation to a strategic orientation, um, which is to say that um, pragmatic conservatives were pragmatic. They weren't necessarily opposed to Iran's nuclear program. They simply saw benefits to um, uh, some kind of a negotiated arrangement with the West, which enabled them to preserve the Iranian nuclear program. There, there have been very few um, serious political figures within the Iranian political establishment who have um, 
you know, sort of disavowed uh, the investment, the enormous investment that the regime has uh, undertaken over the course of 30 years in this nuclear infrastructure. I can't think of anyone who has any real decision-making authority who was a, a notable opponent of the nuclear program. It was really just a question of what is the end state and what is what what are we prepared to do along the way to that end state where there may have been some shades of difference. So I think you know, it's it, it, it's important to recognize that that those who are who embrace negotiations weren't necessarily um, in favor of mm -hmm. uh, of, uh, you know, some sort of abandonment of the nuclear program. Um, but I think, you know, your fundamental point is right. I, I personally don't see any evidence that there is a. Um, uh, you know, a, a serious pull within the current system, which would advocate for um, significant con concessions on the nuclear program in order to sustain its relationship with the West. And I think that's one of the challenges to the kind of isolation component of your strategy, which is that I don't think this government is particularly afraid of isolation, at least not of isolation from Europe and the United States. Um, thank you, Suzanne. I mean, I, I tend to agree, except that I think you're right that there was never sort of a division and I don't like sort of the hardline reformist sort of moderate, but I, you know, the, the way I, I described them in my research, I would say there were two competing, two major competing visions for Iran's grand strategy and that applied to the nuclear as well. And I think you're exactly right. It wasn't about whether we should have a nuclear program or not. Um, but I think still that the difference between them uh, from our perspective was drastic, right? There's a big difference between a hedging um, strategy than actually going for a bomb or a clandestine activity or not. And so there's sort of the, the, the different sort of shades of the gray that... Mike has um, put out, I think in, in that sense, there were, there have been major differences. And, you know, as I said in the beginning of um, what I mentioned about sort of that perception of the sanctions relief is gone. I mean, that's why also that faction <laughs> that supported normalization and sanctions relief is gone because they failed. And sort of the failure of uh any possibility or viability of normalized economic relations, um, you know, it, it just disappeared and with it, uh, the supporters of it. And so having said that and, and said that still the hedging strategy has more support with varying degree of um, differences in, in, in views of how accelerated or how to escalate, when to escalate, how to restrain or not, et cetera. I do think that it's worth mentioning that over the past, and, and I would say from, from President Trump's withdrawal from the deal up until now, I personally have seen an increase in the support for a nuclear weapon within the political elite. And I've also seen it been more publicly and, and vocally um, sort of shared than ever before. So I think that's, that's something to keep in mind and um, to look out for. And, you know, um, th there was the former Iran intelligence um, minister who on national TV made a point about, well, you we don't want nuclear weapons, but when you corner a cat, like, what do you expect kind of uh, argument, which had never been stated officially. So that's my two cents on that. Great. Well, we're just about out of time, but let me ask for some final comments from uh, our three speakers. Let me start with Mike. No, I'll just say, even though I, I, I said before, I was kind of skeptical that the uh, U.S. administration would be willing to adopt a more assertive um, uh, approach to Iran for reasons related to kind of, um, in part, post-Iraq Afghanistan hangover, as well as kind of having a full plate with regard to external and, and domestic crises. The, the, the fact of the matter is, Iran is, is moving forward with the production of um, highly enriched uranium. And we have, in a way, kind of a slow motion nuclear crisis occurring now. And um, so the, the point is, I, I think we can, there is more we can do. 
um, if there's political will. And the question is whether there will be uh, the political will. And there's more we can do, and, and there's more we can do that I think shape Iran's decision making, even in spite of I think the um, the, the the difficulties that I think Masa and, and, and Suzanne kind of discussed. And, and I agree with them 100%. This is a very different context than the past, but there's more we can do, and I, I don't give up hope that we can you know, shape their um, approach moving forward. Well, always the optimist, Masa. Sure, I'm just going to say a, a, a couple of things. One is um, I want to highlight again that I think there is not a, as much appreciation for the political changes and the implications of the current uprising in Iran. And I think the sooner we start giving it the attention that it requires in understanding it and, and planning for it, the better. And second, I would say more important in my view, more important than being more assertive or, or, or aggressive on the US side, um, what's needed is clarity. The, in similar ways, when, when we make a nuclear deal, we have details, very detailed actions on both sides. I think in a situation like we are now for managing this kind of escalation, we require we, we need to be very clear and very detailed about at least some of the steps uh, that we think about. And um, and and at least simultaneously um, with what we are doing right now. Suzanne, final word. I'll just end with thanks um, to both Masa and Mike for a really challenging and interesting conversation and and just a note of, I guess, warning that I think, um, you know, it's been a quiet, relatively quiet year on the Iran nuclear front, not a quiet year at home for Iran. Um, I think that the nuclear crisis is going to inch back up uh, on the list of, of real urgent priorities. Um, and I don't know that there has been enough good thinking about how we manage escalation in lieu of a formal diplomatic arrangement. And so I want to commend Mike for this paper and, and Masa for all the great remarks and, and look forward to many more conversations like this. Thanks. Thank you. And my thanks to all three speakers and especially to Suzanne for teeing us up for our, our next event, which I'm sure will be coming in, in a few months. Thanks ever so much. And thank, thank you, you much, for everybody. joining us today here at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy.